Dr. Sutton, you wrote three series of books while you were a research fellow at the Hoover Institute. Can you give me basically the background of the content of these series? Yes, the, uh, the uh, series I wrote at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University concerned the transfers of Western technology to the Soviet Union and essentially comprised uh, three individual books. Each book covers a period of time since 1917. And then you wrote a second series of books on Wall Street. Yes, uh, these were trade books. Uh, in other words, they're, they're not academic books. They're written for the general public. Uh, they concerned the uh, build-up of the three types of socialism, uh, Bolshevik socialism in Russia, um, what we might call welfare socialism in the United States, and uh, Hitlerian or national socialism. And each book examines the financing and the contributions made by Wall Street by international bankers to, that, to the development of that specific form of socialism. Now, in your research and analysis, and your efforts to bring out the facts about what was going on in our society, did you encounter any effort to discourage you, to prevent you from bringing out the background of America's involvement in the financing of international communism? Yes, very definitely. Um, for example, uh, when I was at the Hoover Institution uh, in 1972, I went to Miami Beach to give some testimony before the um, Republican National Committee. And uh, although a congressman had hand-delivered to the wire services this testimony, which was later printed, uh, the wire services refused to transmit it to the newspapers. Then when I got back to the Hoover Institution um, in California, um, I was called into the office of the director, and uh, I was uh, told in no uncertain terms not to make any more speeches like that, and that this information should not be made public. This was the information that we were uh, giving uh, the, the Soviet Union the technology to develop its war potential? Oh, yes. At that time, we were, in, we, we were in Vietnam, and as you know, the Soviets were supplying the North Vietnamese. This was 1972? 1972, yes. And, uh, for example, I knew that the Gorky plant, which was built by the Ford Motor Company, but the Gorky plant in Russia produces the gas a series of vehicles. The gas vehicles had been seen on Ho Chi Minh Trail. We were supplying equipment to the Gorky plant in the middle of the Vietnamese War, and these trucks were being used to carry ammunition supplies, which were killing Americans. Now, I thought this was morally wrong, and I said so in Miami Beach and at the Hoover Institution. And it was this type of information uh, that was suppressed. And so what eventually happened as far as your activities at the Hoover Institution were concerned? Well, I didn't pay much heed to the warnings. I, I published a book called National Suicide in the following year, which um, summarized our assistance to uh, the Soviets, our military assistance to the Soviets. And when that book came out, the grain, again, there was great pressure to stop the book. Uh, both on, there was pressure on both the publishers and me personally. And... Uh, I felt I couldn't take this, and a few years later, I just left the Hoover Institution, and since 1975, I've been an independent author without any ties whatsoever. Let's go a little bit into the background of the financing of the German war machine that we fought in the period 1941 to 1945. Could we start, first of all, with the original financing of Hitler between 1922 and 1923, uh, 1923 when he was first making his effort to come into prominence in Germany? The uh, original financing of Hitler, that's in the years 1922, came only partly from Germany. Uh, one of the most prominent Americans concerned with financing Hitler was uh, Henry Ford. In fact, Henry Ford received a medal in 1938 for his assistance to the early Nazi party. Then, of course, Hitler had his attempted push in uh, 1923. He went to jail, and then we begin another era in the rise of Hitler. Right, and of course he eventually came to power in 1933 uh, by the electoral process. What about the financing of Hitler's um, electoral activities in 1933? But this, this I can trace, I have traced it very exactly. I discovered uh, amongst the Nuremberg records a series of bank transfer slips um, to the Delbruck Schickler Bank in Berlin to an account which was under the control of Rudolf Hess. And this was the fund that was used to finance Hitler's access to power in March 1973. And amongst the corporations uh, that transferred money to Hitler, I find not only R.G. Farben, which is, which is quite widely known, but also uh, German General Electric, AEG, 
which is under, under the control of General Electric in the United States, or was at that time, and com uh, companies like Osram and... Um, now, what was the tie-in between Osram and General Electric? The tie-in was a share tie-in. International General Electric in the United States had controlling interest in German General Electric and also through share interlocks, uh, a controlling interest in Osram in, in Germany. So then we have Ford and we have General Electric helping to finance Adolf Hitler's mm -hmm. rise to power. Mm -hmm. Were any other large American corporations involved? Uh, very definitely. Um, Standard Oil, through its uh, technical association with IG Farben, um, uh, for example, uh, Germany could not have gone to war in 1939 without uh, tetraethyl. You need tetraethyl to raise the octane value of aviation gasoline. Germany had no means of doing that. This was developed in the, um, in the ethyl uh, laboratories in the United States and transferred uh, to the Germans. Uh, Standard Oil came up with the hydrogenation idea, which was very essential for Germany in the 1930s because the, uh, to raise the quality of its gasoline for aviation purposes. This was transferred to the Nazis. And uh, ITT, for example, International Telephone and Telegraph, uh, was very intimately associated with the Nazis uh, through Dr. Schroeder, who was head of the um, ITT subsidiaries in uh, Germany. And ITT controlled companies which made not only um, um, electrical instruments, but also the Fock Wolf plant, which made um, airplanes, uh, fighter airplanes. So what you're suggesting then is that American corporations were helping to finance the German industry that was building up the war potential? American corporations, only a few, not many, financed Hitler through their subsidiaries. They transferred technology. They transferred material assistance, for example, stocks of tetraethyl before the Germans could manufacture it under the joint manufacturing agreement with the United States. And also they financed this. For example, Standard Oil financed in 1933 the development of the um, gasoline industry in uh, Germany, which was needed to fight World War II. And that's a very interesting point. Could you go a little bit into the background of where Germany got its oil? to fight the Second World War, because certainly Germany doesn't have oil resources. Germany does not have oil resources, that's true. It uh, used in World War II synthetic oil, which it, did, which it uh, got from coal. And the basic technical processes for the development of oil from coal came from the United States, from uh, essentially from the Standard Oil Laboratories, which had this technical assistance agreement with IG Farben. And of course IG Farben contributed uh, something like 60% of the explosives needed um, by the German Wehrmacht, uh, probably about 40-50% of the gasoline needed by the Wehrmacht and by the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe. And was there a definite interlock between IG Farben and Standard Oil? The uh, interlock was at the technical level the exchange of patents. It was through a financial technical assistance agreement. There were other interlocks with the United States uh, through a uh, subsidiary, IG Farben, um, in the United States. But with Standard Oil, the interlocks were the technical and financial level. And is it a fact, it's been stated, that there were members of the board of directors of Standard Oil who were also on the board of directors of American IG Farben? Yes, uh, Walter Teagle is one name that comes to mind. And well, there were several, there were several directors. Was there an interlock with Ford between IG Farben and uh, American IG Farben and the Ford Motor Company? Um, not that I can recall, not offhand. Not offhand. So basically what we're seeing then is American industry helping to provide the technology, helping to f provide the finance, helping to provide the material that is going to allow Hitler to create his war machine. Yes, that is correct. That is correct. Now, 